I'd like to talk about customer focus as a prescription for innovation. When we talk about innovation, we've got a rich and profound subject on our hands because innovation is so central to strength and growth and vitality of people, of organizations, of society itself. Innovation is in our very genes. So I have a lot of humility about addressing this subject. That is why this morning I will concentrate on a few aspects of innovation where my own experiences come to bear. I'd like to look at three questions with you. First, what is innovation and why is customer focus so important to innovation? Second, what makes innovation happen? What are the engines of innovation? And third, I'll ask the question, what needs to be done to sustain innovation? So, what do we mean by innovation? And why is customer focus so important? Thomas Edison said it very well when he asked, is there a way to do it better? And responded, find it. Edison's point is succinct and deep. He is telling us that innovation is not just great thinking or great creativity in a vacuum. It is creativity that is active, that delivers something new and better. And also, it implies new and better for a purpose that adds value. So, what I would like to suggest is that we can think of innovation as creativity in action. In other words, applied creativity. Applied creativity that creates something new and better and adds values for individuals and for society. We don't know who invented it, but the wheel did not change civilization simply because of the creative genius that went into discovery. The wheel was a profound innovation because it was applied. The application of the wheel to transport and thousands of other needs transformed human life for the better. I think we can see this formula in every real innovation. Some of those innovations radically changed the world. Innovations such as the steam engine, the telephone, the automobile, the airplane, the microchip. Other innovations add value in smaller ways. Power steering, synthetic clothing fabrics, the zipper, the iPod. Here is another example of applied creativity that I just read about. According to Nature magazine, researchers learned that U.S. soldiers serving in Iraq and on other missions did not always have access to toothbrushes and floss. So it seems that some 15% of soldiers reported they were suffering from toothaches and gum disease. In response to this need, the researchers identified a protein fragment called KSL. KSL eats holes in the cell membranes of the bacteria that cause dental disease and kills them. Then the researchers figured out how to embed KSL in chewing gum. The chewing gum formulation turns the creativity of the KSL discovery into a solution for soldiers and others who can't brush or floss. According to Patrick DeLuca, one of the researchers who invented the new chewing gum, the innovation is valuable not only for the military, but also for the avid outdoorsman and anyone else on the go. Perhaps it'll even be useful for many people here and at many other universities as well. My own industry, the research-based pharmaceutical industry, is a special example of innovation. At its essence, 
What we do is to transform great science into treatments that improve and save people's lives. This is very complex work, and it certainly begins in the science laboratory with basic research by talented scientists to, d to discover new chemical compounds or new molecules. However, to turn this scientific creativity into an innovation, we then engage thousands of other people in highly complex and costly actions. Actions that transform a molecule into a treatment with the applications of more and more creativity going forward. This is applied creativity. Creativity that creates something new or better to improve health. I'll come back to some of the special dimensions of pharmaceutical innovation in a moment. But now, let me turn to the importance of customer focus that I mentioned before. When Edison said, is there a way to do it better? He was implying a benefit and outcome to someone. There are many ways that we could talk about who that someone is. I would like to suggest that one of the best ways to think about the, the, the beneficiary of innovation, it is really to think about the customer. I'm talking here about customer in a broad way, as someone to whom you deliver added value and as someone who expects added value. In other words, the customer is a person or an organization or, or, or a society that has a need that will be met by innovation. Focusing on the customer thus becomes a way of figuring out how to make innovation happen. Just think of one recent innovation, Apple's iPod. The iPod is a spectacular innovation. It responds to the desire of consumers for personal, portable, flexible music. It takes the creative technology of storing music electronically and it applies it with further creativity into a new consumer electronic device. Now the iPod is transforming how people listen to music and how they share music and how they socialize. The iPod is a great example of the power of customer focus. By being in tune with its customers, by sensing an unmet need, Apple could apply its creativity to add value. The moral here is that innovation does not happen in a vacuum or inside a closed system. Scientists and technicians could labor for decades over the same electronics that are inside an iPod and never produce this spectacular consumer breakthrough. It was customer focus that was the prescription for this innovation. The iPod example also shows us another very important dimension of innovation. Back in the 17th century, the great Sir Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further, it's by standing upon the shoulders of giants. What he was saying is that his work could only happen because of the foundations created by others. Most innovation builds on many other advances that come before them. Even what appears to be a big breakthrough innovation, in fact, as, as, as Newton put it, really comes from building on the shoulders of giants. So when you look at an iPod, it is standing on the shoulders of an old-fashioned tape player or on the shoulders of microchip advances or on the shoulders of Sony's Walkman and Discman and many, many other innovations. Also, every medical breakthrough is built on the shoulders of other giants. For example, the treatment of cardiovascular disease, especially high cholesterol. We all know that this is one of the biggest killer diseases in the world. 
Now we have created very effective treatments, breakthrough treatments for high cholesterol. These are responses to a very serious need of the ultimate consumer, which in this case happens to be the patient. The incremental innovations that led up to these treatments, however, go back many decades. The first so-called statin medicine was discovered back in the early 70s. Then scientists built on that knowledge and created the first synthetic statin molecules. In 1987, Merck brought out the first widely available statin called Mevacor. Other statins followed, important statins such as Zocor and, Lip and, uh, and Lipitor and many, many others. So you can see that we have made progress in this area. And that's where my own company, Sharing Plow, also comes in. We discovered a completely new medicine called azetamide that attacks cholesterol through a new mechanism of action. Now, this medicine is creating a new paradigm for treating cholesterol. Statins act by going through the liver. Azetamide acts by going through the intestinal tract. It attacks cholesterol from a different approach. And that's why when you combine azetamide with a statin, you have a much more powerful medicine. Innovation in action. Another dimension of customer focus that is of enormous importance is customer service. In many ways, customer service is process innovation in action. All innovation doesn't have to be product innovation. You can also have process innovation. As we all know, it is usually not enough as a customer to benefit just from a great product or a great innovation. You want follow-up. You want help in applying the innovation effectively. You want solutions if it breaks or fails. Customer service is often the weak link of innovation. We hear, for example, that Apple is today facing a challenge with consumers who are discovering that the iPod is rather fragile. It can break when someone steps on it or drops it. After someone has just stored a lifetime of music preferences on her iPod, when it shatters underfoot, you can imagine the response. How Apple handles the customer service challenge may well become very significant in the long-term success of the iPod innovation. So those are some ways of describing innovation and of seeing why customer focus is so important to making innovation happen. Now, let me turn to the second question that I'd like to look at with you. What makes innovation happen? What are the engines of innovation? This is a huge question. So I'll focus today on just a few aspects that come out of my own experience. I think the most critical, in, the most critical engine of innovation in any organization is a passionate attitude of customer focus and people who are liberated to pursue that passion. This follows from what I talked about earlier. A truly customer focused organization almost by definition will drive innovation because innovation is the means by which it satisfies the unmet needs of the customers. It's not uncommon to hear from a company, yes, we are customer focused. Our salespeople or our marketing people are deeply engaged with our customers. This is good, but it's not good enough. I do strongly believe that sales professionals have a very special role with customers. In high innovation industries, salespeople are much more than just a message channel. In an industry such as ours, the goal should be to have sales professionals who act as special sensing mechanisms for the organization. 
through a strong personal relationship with customers, sales professionals get in tune with customer needs. They transmit customer needs back into the company. They help identify the innovation needs and help to galvanize the organization into innovation action. However, if only the sales or sales and marketing people are engaged, innovation will not happen. Innovation happens when everyone has a passion and is engaged with the customer. Innovation happens when everyone feels part of the team. This passion for the customer and this engagement must begin at the top with the CEO. For example, I meet regularly with doctors and other customers in our business. Just recently, I met with a very important expert on infectious diseases. He gave me some exciting ideas on the needed innovations in the treatment of hepatitis C, which is an area that we specialize in and which is a disease that's all over the place and an area of great unmet medical need. I internalized those ideas and I communicated them to our people working in this area. It is important for people in the organization to see this kind of customer engagement at the top. I do also stay in close contact with our salespeople because they are such an important customer sensing mechanism. And we seek to have all the other units in the company also feel empathy to be in tune with our customers. For example, I tell our research bench scientists they should be courageous in championing innovative molecules that they believe in, even if commercial data may suggest that there is no big demand for the molecule. Many times, you don't see a market based on what you look at marketing research. You have to envision a market and create a market. So I encourage people to look at their vision and chase their visions. Over my career, I've seen a lot of important medicines get to patients despite the advice of marketing consultants because those medicines had a courageous champion in research and development or somewhere else in the organization. A courageous champion who saw the customer and who saw the patient need. So that is one powerful engine of innovation the right attitude, a passionate customer focus everywhere in the organization, led from the top. Another vital engine of innovation is the right behaviors. People are by instinct clannish. We tend to be suspicious of other groups and we like to congregate in our own small groups. And we also like total control. But innovation is not achieved by individual genius or by any one unit in a company. The challenge, especially in large, complex organizations, is to break down the natural human and organizational barriers. It means deliberately fostering behaviors that do not naturally come to people or to organizations. Behaviors such as collaboration across units, behaviors such as shared accountability and transparency. These are the kinds of behaviors that unleash innovation. They unlock the applied creativity of many talents so that the power of many together is greater than people working separately. I also have found that it is extremely important to reward two categories of people, the passionate drivers and the people who advance innovation through failure. The passionate drivers are those people who do not give up their cause in the face of corporate pressures that might otherwise grind them down. These are very important people who must be nurtured. And so are the people and teams that achieve great failures, they must also be nurtured. 
By great failures, I mean the projects that do not become successful innovations, but instead generate vital learnings. Vital learnings that make other successful innovations possible. We would have to ask Steve Jobs how many great failures went into the iPod. I can give you one of my many examples from my own experience. In a previous company where I was CEO, we acquired a very exciting biotechnology operation. The acquisition itself was something of an innovation. At first, the thinking on all sides was that we should simply in-license some of the biotech companies' compounds into our own research and development. But then one morning, while I was shaving, I had the idea that we should not just in-license, we should buy the company. Yes, there were a lot of risks, but buying the company would give us more than just the existing projects and products. We will be, be bringing in longer term research and development pipeline projects, and we would also bring in the intellectual capital that was there in the biotech companies, scientists, and technologists. So we bought the company. There were big hopes for the lead compound of this biotechnology company. Well, it failed. And so did two further expensive and energy consuming projects. Some people lost faith. A lot of investors questioned the acquisition. But each of the failures was a great one. Each failure led to progress by a team of passionate drivers who would not give up. More than six years later, the fourth compound has become a winning innovation. This fourth compound has become an important, innovative new treatment for cancer. It just got approved very recently. And the final engine of innovation that I would like us to look at is the engine of a powerful product flow system. What is this engine? Basically, it's a system that channels and maximizes the attitudes and the behaviors just described with a relentless focus on the customer. In virtually every organization that seems to innovate, there is a front end of research and early creativity. There is the middle that tests, refines, and develops the early creativity. And then there are finally the groups that move the final innovation to the customers, manufacturing, marketing, and sales. Supporting all these areas are functions such as finance and information technology and many other functions. In conventional organizations, all these other units operate as silos. Research is disconnected from the development units and R&D is disconnected from marketing and sales. Manufacturing sits in its own silo and so on. Products move through the product pipeline in handoffs over the walls of these silos. Innovation is often lost or compromised. The flow is slow. The response to customer need is distorted or diluted. So a vital task for any organization is to create seamless interactions among the units while having all the units focused on the customer, in tune with the customer. There are free and easy interactions among all the units. At the same time, there are strong, transparent, and operating processes, strong, transparent gating mechanisms before compounds get promoted to the next level, and mutually agreed upon timeframes for moving projects through the system. Let me highlight one very interesting and very important feature of our innovative product flow system. Progress through this system is not simply a linear process. There are loop backs and loop forwards, but it's not random. It's not what we call random Brownian motion. It is purposeful. 
The looping is creative, productive, and adds value, enhances the innovation, makes it more responsive to the customer need. Let me give you one example of how the combined engines of customer-focused attitude, behavior, and product flow system generate special innovation. <clears throat> In my previous company, Pharmacia, we identified a potentially exciting molecule that could attack infections in a new way. At, this, at that time, that was a bold treatment area to be looking at because many people still believed that existing antibiotics were all that were needed. Our people had a different vision, one that proved to be the right decision. Yet, while we had the creativity element in a new family of antibiotic molecules, we still didn't know what we would do with these in terms of a vision. The applied creativity that would transform this, this discovery into a medicine would, was, was really a very, very interesting process. It really happened through the research people, the development people, the sales and marketing people, and the manufacturing people coming together in a seamless way. They came together seamlessly to achieve applied creativity. Initially, there was a hypothesis that the right approach was to create a treatment that would be effective against a limited number of infections for very acute cases, hospital cases. But through dialogues with our customers, the teams discovered that in fact, doctors had a big need for a powerful new antibiotic that would work against a wide array of infections. The teams looped back and forth reshaping the focus, refining the compound. There were many further refinements of delivery mechanisms so that the treatment that could be applied was an intravenous drip or also a pill. Clinical trial plans were developed early so that they would support regulatory applications for indications that would be the most important for the customers and for the doctors. Again, through cross-functional shared accountability work our research, development, and the commercial people and the manufacturing people worked very well together. The result was Zyvox, a major innovation in antibiotics. Zyvox which was achieved through customer-focused attitude, behaviors, and the overall product flow system. Of course, we are not alone in creating engines for innovation. My friend at Procter & Gamble, A.G. Laffey, the company's chief executive officer, is an effective innovation leader. He inherited a big challenge when he became CEO of Procter & Gamble in 2000. To lift stodgy old P&G out of a flat growth pattern, Laffey basically turned the old product development process on its head. The old way was to develop new products and then test them on customers, or to survey customers and try to fulfill their needs. Unfortunately, consumers don't always buy what they say. They, what you hear in surveys is not what you see in consumer behavior. So Laffley had his staff go out and observe people using household tools and products around the world. He also created an innovation gym where, where the P&G managers could team up with innovation designers from outside the company, and sometimes from outside the industry. One new product has been Mr. Clean Magic Reach. It uses a four-foot detachable pole to clean bathrooms. Feedback from customers and the commercial success of this new device suggests that it was a real breakthrough. So far this morning, we've talked about what we mean by innovation and the importance of customer focus. We've also looked at the engines of innovation. In these last few minutes before our Q&A, I would like to look at the third and final topic that I said I would talk about today, which is sustaining innovation. You might ask, 
Won't a strong innovation organization keep innovation in its DNA? The answer is no. As the environment keeps changing, organizations must constantly adapt, re-engineer, and change how they innovate. There are lots of examples of what happens when organizations fail to do this. Look at the U.S. auto industry. Forty years ago, the U.S. auto industry led the world in innovation. Detroit was in touch with its customers. It was in tune. It kept evolving, kept changing. Its mantra was customer focus in every level of the organization. Words like Mustang and Thunderbird conjured up excitement and style. But at a certain point, as the pace of change in the world grew faster, Detroit fell behind and fell out of tune. Now we see the U.S. car makers struggling with this very difficult inheritance. They face a downward spiral of performance. They face a failure in customer focus and a resulting collapse of innovation. The, so I think it's clear that one dimension of sustaining innovation must come from within organizations. The key is a certain kind of leadership. To sustain the power to innovate, organizations must keep innovating in how they themselves operate. It all comes back to customer focus. Customers and their needs keep changing. Organizations that seek to innovate must keep evolving with the customers. In my view, therefore, constantly renewing and reinventing the organization is perhaps the most important job of the CEO in a large global innovation enterprise today. From electronics to clothing and fashion to healthcare to banking and beyond. In our own company, we have a model engaged in constant and transformational change. Our mantra is new thinking, new capabilities, new urgency. Our mindset is that it must be led and modeled from the top. And because ours is such a long-term innovation process industry, I will be judged on how well I'm doing this today for the next 10 to 15 years. So one critical dimension of sustainable innovation is innovation strength of enterprises through constant renewal on the inside. And I would suggest to you that there is also a need for fostering innovation in the broader environment that we all operate in. In government, among shareholders, among citizens, among all the stakeholders in our society. Today, we're hearing concerns that the U.S. is losing its innovation edge. I think this is a genuine concern. We do see some signs of innovation erosion. And we do see some signs of innovation migration. For example, the signs that countries such as China and India may be building special headroom and attractiveness for innovation at our expense. Last Friday, the New York Times reported that 38% of multinational corporations surveyed plan to shift substantial portions of their research and development work to centers in China and India over the next three years. In response to this trend, some people advocate investing massive amounts of government funding in science and other building blocks of innovation. I say money is helpful, but money is not the only solution. From my perspective, the best answer lies in our own mindset and in our own culture. Historically, the United States has been almost synonymous with innovation from the creation of a new kind of democracy right through to Google. But just as companies must keep reinventing themselves, so must our society reinvent itself. Our society must reinvent itself in order to respond to new and changing needs for innovation and new and changing global competition. 
Who is the customer when it comes to society? It is ourselves and our future generations of citizens. My sense is that we need to revitalize and re-energize re the innovation climate in our country. Just one symptom of this may be the increasing short-term perspective of the financial markets. Complex innovation is a long-haul investment. In my industry, we place multi-billion dollar bets over the 10 to 15 year cycles required to transform a molecule into a medicine. It becomes very hard to keep placing those bets when many in the investment community seem to be focused more on quarterly numbers than on long-term high performance. Another symptom of this need to revitalize our innovation culture is the failure of Americans to save. Individually and as a society, we're spending more than we earn. As of September 05, the US government owed China $252 billion. And the Chinese buy about $4 billion more in treasury bills every month. Another symptom of the need for innovation is the declining numbers of science students. Time magazine just ran a cover article asking if that decline doesn't represent another Sputnik. Shouldn't we be alarmed? Today, most Americans have a remarkably high level of financial literacy. This has been the result of many converging factors, including the increasing responsibility more and more people feel for their own long-term financial decisions. And this financial literacy has also been helped by the television channels that focus on financial news. The time may be ripe for working on the challenge of a new frontier, achieving much greater innovation literacy throughout our society. This innovation literacy would include such dimensions as a fuller understanding of what innovation is what, and what innovation does for society and how innovation can be sustained. For example, on the subject of healthcare, we must find and apply major new healthcare innovations in this country in order to save health security for the future. This will be an innovation challenge that is as big as any that we've seen in the recent decades. The number of people keeps getting older, the demand for innovation keeps going up, and the cost of health care keeps going up. And unless we are more innovative, there won't be enough money to pay for the whole system. Overall, I'm certain that we can revitalize the understanding that our fellow citizens have about innovation and what sustains innovation, and we would see a renewed and strengthening excitement about fostering innovation. New thinking, new capabilities, new urgency. The passion to innovate for customers keeps business enterprises alive, energized, and growing. We must rekindle this same passion in our society so that this country continues to be an innovation light for the rest of the world. Alive, energized, growing. We all have a stake in this because as citizens, we are customers. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for q and I'd welcome any questions. We have a hand up there. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I teach strategic management in several MBA programs at European universities. And when we look at sharing the cloud, the second most frequent question I get is what was happening in sharing the cloud that led to the crisis that you faced when you became CEO? So uh, just so you understand what the crises were, the crises were that the company was doing extremely well, growing nicely, and then suddenly something happened in 0203 that caused sales to go down dramatically and profits to go down 
in a very, very dramatic manner. And the reason was that the company had become very dependent on a previous innovation, which was Claritin, uh, an allergy medicine that was a non-sedating antihistamine. So it was an innovation at that time compared to sedating antihistamines, but had failed to renew its innovation. So when the product was lost to a patent expiry, there wasn't anything new to replace it. And the lesson to be learned is never take your success for granted. It's when the company is doing well, it's when the sales are rising, that's the time when you invest aggressively in your future growth, in your future renewal, and don't assume that your cash machine is gonna last forever. So that's the, that's the basic lesson to be learned here. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Alex Chang. I'm from the Biotechnology Council in Germany. Um, getting back to the idea of innovation, um, what would you suggest would be a metric that the government should use when calculating GDP to, uh, to value innovation in its calculations? That's a very good question because presently uh, a lot of the conventional metrics do not measure innovation properly. For example, we're all living healthier and living better thanks to the good uh, medicines or good m medical devices that exist uh, these days. But when you look at the way the government looks at these figures, they see healthcare as an expense, not as something of value. So conventional economics are not picking up the metrics we should be using to measure innovation. I think innovation should be measured in terms of uh, what are the new things we're doing? We use a term called freshness index in our industry, which means how much of our sales are coming from products that were introduced uh, in the last 10 years. And if your freshness index falls off, then you know you're starting to get stale. Maybe the government should be looking at some kind of a freshness index in terms of innovation. I see a hand in the back there. I mean, uh, specifically related to the pressure that big pharma companies are feeling from the generic sector, how does that affect your uh, innovation plots going forward? You know, to keep better on that. Yeah, in many ways, uh, the generic companies fulfill a very valuable purpose for society because once the innovator has used up their temporary monopoly, which comes from a patent, and they've used up their reward for innovation, then it becomes a free for all and the price of the product goes down to the level of manufacturing cost plus 20% or manufacturing cost plus 30%. Uh, that's, that's the way it happens. And so in that sense, uh, generic companies help society because they bring down the cost of healthcare through a very vigorous competitive free market system that exists in the US. Where the industry has had some concerns with generic companies is the new cottage industry that's developed of uh, attacking patents. That I don't think is a good idea because if you do not have the reward for innovation, why would you spend a lot of money for 10 to 15 years when you might get harassed by patent challenges down the road? You must be able to enjoy the reward of innovation in order to innovate further. And in that regard, the recent trend of uh, patent challenges by, by the generic industries is somewhat of concern. As you know, in Europe, they give the manufacturer a minimum of 10 or 11 years exclusivity regardless of any other factor and the manufacturer can, award, can enjoy that, uh, that, uh, that reward. That's not the case in the US where it is a bit of a free for all when it comes to challenging patents. Um, I think we have a hand up here. Sorry, I'm making you exercise a lot here. Thank you very much. Thank you for the very great speech. I am, my name is Guillermo Reina, and I am an MBA student, first year. Uh, culturally, we are prepared for success in our families, uh, first years in school, then universities, and then working in corporations. We are prepared to succeed. How universities and corporations can switch and Make them understand that a failure is no is no is no problem. That a failure is a great opportunity to learn for the great for the concept that you have of the great failures. Thank you. 
Now, that's a very important point because I think our society, and especially I think if you look at global societies, American society tends to be more brutal on failures than maybe some other societies. And some societies find failure extremely embarrassing for the personal person, like in the Japanese society. I think it's very important that as a global world, we start to look upon failure as a learning opportunity. Because in my experience, some of the best learnings have come from failure. And I think we need to create that culture in universities, in corporations, because then you create more courage and more experimentation. If you have uh, a culture where failure is punished, then you have a risk adverse culture or a risk, risk averse culture, and then people don't experiment or try new things. So I agree with you. We need to have a higher tolerance for failure as long as there is a commitment that the person learns from failure. That's very important. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Matthew Schneider with Amber Services. In my industry, which is insurance brokerage, we see the premiums for companies like yours and your competitors uh, going up quite a bit because of litigation issues. Litigation seems to be an enemy in some ways of innovation. On the other way, it's supposed to be protection of people. How do you balance that and how do you deal with the increased cost to innovate uh, as you try to push the envelope? This is a real problem for our society, and as you know, the American society is unique in this regard. The rest of the world tends to keep this kind of litigation under control, but here it's, a, it's a totally, uh, it's really the Wild West. And it's gotten worse in the recent decades. It's become an organized system, and I think it is, uh, it is extracting a huge toll on the economy, and um, it's not good. I think especially this uh, concept which began with the founding fathers of uh, the right to the, 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 uh, the rule of law and the, 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 the trial by jury, which was intended to be a way to protect citizens from problems, has now gotten used in the wrong manner. And now people try to stay away from the rule of law, especially in certain counties where you know you'll get the kind of uh, juries which are not necessarily balanced ju juries. So this is a real issue, I think, in our society. And we need to keep working at trying to contain it. It's right now not in control, unfortunately. Yes. Yes, sir. You talked about innovation and with the products, with the sharing of products, and uh, uh, there's a move around patient centricity where healthcare providers, the payers, and the pharmas are, are focusing more on the patient. And pharmas are a bit uh, further away than the providers and the payers <coughs> who are uh, not closer to the patient. And in terms of innovation, this one part is the product, innovating the product. Yes. But the other side is, what do you do beyond providing maintenance drugs to the patients, but be closer to the patient's health overall. This is very important because uh, we uh, like to call ourselves uh, people who create health solutions as opposed to create drugs. I think uh, we have to think in a much, much bigger sense. As I said earlier, it's not just product innovation, it's also process innovation. It's understanding the whole system. For example, if we are in the cholesterol business, we certainly benefit from selling more products like Vitorin, but we also have to take a great interest in what happens to the patients uh, in terms of their health. So we spend a lot of money in outcomes research, large trials where we keep learning more and more about what cholesterol is. We look at other aspects of improving uh, patient health because drugs should be used along with other inputs to manage the certain diseases. The best way to manage cholesterol is to do a lot of uh, exercise and to watch your diet. And in many cases, you don't even need a cholesterol medicine. So it's, it's the job of society and the job of the companies to, 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 to really do the right thing, as opposed to just maximizing the profits of their own products. Mr. Yes. Sean, yeah. Yes, we have a lot of hands. I'm sorry, yes, there's just not enough time. So. You, you, I think you're the lucky person with the last question. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph McCart. Wonderful inaugural lecture up here. Thank you. Uh, one of the, uh, the challenges in changing organizations to get that passion, the passion driver, to get that innovation, is to change the culture. What are some of the, and you have done it successfully and masterfully in many organizations. How have you overcome those challenges? What are some of the challenges and some of the inside secrets? 
Thank you very much. I think if you want to do an analogy uh, with another industry, if you go to the Four Seasons Hotel, uh, whether you go to the hotel in Cairo or you go to the hotel in Buenos Aires or you go to the hotel in Miami or, or New York, you get a certain quality of uh, people who greet you, who treat you as a real customer and who follow through and they seem to know about your background when you check in. There's a certain system that works, but then there's also an attitude that exists among the staff in the, uh, in, in, in the Four Seasons. They hire people with an attitude of being more focused on the outside than on their own agendas. People who look outside first as opposed to looking inside first. And uh, they have a certain quality. So it's not only the attitude, it's also training, systems, skills, uh, being in tune. That's, that's really what happens. And I have to say it, but if uh, you don't model it from the top, it doesn't happen. Too many companies give great speeches and then they break the psychological contract with their workers by doing things which are different from what the speech is said. And once you break the psychological contract, the passion starts to disappear. So you must be consistent and true to yourself uh, in terms of what you say and then act, act, act on what you say. So that's, that's, uh, that's the last uh, comment I'd make.